Hey, I'm here today to do a quick update to let you know how the first week of the March of the Mammoths readathon has been going for me. Here's my lovely stack of books that I have started within the past few days. The first week of the readathon has been a bit of a mixed bag for me, as it usually is year from year on week one. Because, you know, at the start, before the readathon actually begins, I make these pretty ambitious plans and I set myself a daily quota of how many pages I need to read. And then if I actually end up being kind of busy, I'm not able to meet those page counts and I feel like I'm already behind when we haven't really begun. So that definitely happened to me. Uh, March happened much sooner than I thought it was going to. I had not finished all of the books that I was reading in February, so that took up a few days of my reading, having to, to finish up some old things. I also got hit with like a huge migraine on the second day of the readathon, so that slowed me down. But the good news is I was able to read a lot this past weekend. I've started all four of my mammoths. I'm at least 100 pages in to each of them. And I'm really happy with my choices so far this year. I think that this is going to be a really wonderful stack of books. And I'm feeling quite energetic and enthusiastic at the start of this journey. So I wanted to tell you about how it's going with each of these books. And I'm going to talk about them in the order from my favorite to my least favorite. But again, we're just one week in and it is really too early to tell. But I do know the book that I am the most excited to pick up every day so far has been Red Comet, the biography of Sylvia Plath. I am now 190 pages into it. So, you know, we're, we're starting to make a bit of a dent. At this point in the biography, we are following Plath during her college years and kind of her bell jar years. So I'm really interested in learning about how much of her fiction was kind of based on things from her real life. But I am surprised at how much I have enjoyed this biography from page one, because usually I find the slowest parts of a biography are when we get too much detail about someone's parents or or their childhood, you know, the kind of less eventful parts of their life. But I have to say that Heather Clark is doing a great job of making everything seem relevant, even though it is still like very thorough and detailed. I really enjoyed learning more about Plath's parents and placing them in the context of being immigrants from Germany and Austria and how that part of their identity shaped their personalities and their parenting style. It was really horrific reading about how Sylvia Plath's father died he essentially self-diagnosed himself with lung cancer and he was sick for quite a few years and didn't go and get medical help. He just kind of wanted to die without getting surgery or any treatment. But then near the end of his life, they did end up consulting a doctor who revealed that he didn't have lung cancer and he actually had diabetes. And if he had come in earlier in the course of his illness to get treatment for it, they probably would have been able to help him. So that was kind of like a PSA moment about why you probably shouldn't be self-diagnosing yourself. So it was very interesting learning all about about, uh, her parents and also I really appreciate how much Heather Clark is trying to incorporate Sylvia's own words in this biography. She's included a lot of the poems that she was writing as a child and through her adolescence and it's really cool to get to see her voice develop. It seems like she's always been someone who's been interested in the natural world and kind of connecting that with her feelings but it's so cool to watch her skills sharpen over the years. She especially had an influential English teacher in high school who sounds like he was the coolest. It sounds like this teacher was running this like advanced college level English lit course that students would take all throughout high school, but they got to read so many great classics and write essays about them and have these class discussions. I was like so jealous <laughs> reading about these high school kids. Really reading this book has made me feel like my education has really not been top notch <laughs> since Sylvia Plath just seems like she is working so hard to be a good student. The academic programs that she's in seem to be very rigorous and much more intense than anything that I was ever exposed to. So I'm really interested in learning about that side of her. And I like that that's what Heather Clark is focusing on in this biography. She mentioned right away in the preface that she doesn't want to do the same old, same old Plath biography that's really focused on like the depression and the doom and gloom and like every decision is leading up to the infamous suicide. But she would rather focus on the complexities of Sylvia's personality as well as the brilliant work that she was doing throughout her life. So I have to say, I love that angle that she's taking. I get so excited every day to pick up this book. So it is my favorite mammoth 
so far of the pile. Another mammoth that I'm really looking forward to picking up every day is Anna Karenina, which I am rereading. So it's kind of cool going into the story a second time because I'm not that focused on plots. I know exactly where the story is headed, but I'm more interested in how Tolstoy is going to take us there. So I'm very interested in how he's choosing to reveal information and what we're learning about the characters and when we're learning that. So I'm appreciating going into this one with a more analytical perspective, I guess. So like, for example, I was really interested in how he started the story. And we start from Oblonsky's perspective, who's, you know, not one of like the major characters in this, but I thought it was interesting that Tolstoy starts off from the perspective of an adulterous husband. Because while he's viewed as someone who has made a mistake, his mistake is viewed as kind of natural. I mean, he's a man and men have passions and he's got to act on those. And women are kind of just expected to forgive their husbands in these cases. And I think that this will make for a good comparison when we see Anna start to go off with her affair and how she's going to be treated by her family and by society because a woman who cheats on her husband is viewed as very unnatural. And I'm curious to see like the contrasts that are going to be developed through that. One of my big surprises was that I don't hate Levin at this point. I remember growing really tired of him the first time that I read this novel, but I found him really endearing in the first few chapters of this book. I'm really like rooting for him in the whole proposal scene. Like that was really hard to watch. And I'm really interested in the ideas that he's sharing and how he doesn't really know exactly what his life philosophy is yet, but he is someone who is thinking deeply about the world and the kind of meaningful life that he wants to live. So yeah, I am enjoying diving back into this world. The drama is really starting to unfold. The gossip is starting to go off in St. Petersburg about what Anna is up to. And I really enjoy following that story. I also loved the scene that was set at the ball. I found this great Russian waltz playlist on YouTube that made for perfect atmospheric music to listen to while reading this scene. So yeah, I am having fun getting back into Anna Karenina. I'm always kind of surprised that the book is as long as it is because I feel like a lot of like the big events have happened already. So it's interesting how Tolstoy is going to stretch out the story <laughs> for so many more pages, but still having a positive time with it so far. And then I'm also enjoying A Suitable Boy by Vikram Seth. This one is by far my biggest mammoth. I'm like 250 pages in and it looks like I have barely made a dent. <laughs> I will say that this one was a bit more difficult to get into. Like it took some time before I was feeling pretty engaged with the story. And I think that's because this one just has like a huge cast of characters and the novel opens at a wedding. So we're introduced to a lot of these people at the party and I just found it a bit tricky keeping track of all of the characters and how they know each other. But as the story continues, I'm feeling Feeling more comfortable in this world and who's connected with who. So I think it's kind of hilarious that I'm 250 pages in and you know most novels are wrapping up around this point and I feel like this one has really barely gotten going. So it's a bit of a slower plot for sure but I kind of appreciate that Seth is not rushed. He's taking his time. He's introducing us to these characters. We're seeing them at these normal moments in their everyday life and I think that that will make it more interesting when the plot starts to pick up. And then the mammoth that I'm enjoying the least so far <laughs> is the one that I thought I would enjoy the least so far, uh, and that is Tom Jones by Henry Fielding. Now, I don't actively dislike this, which I was worried about that I really wouldn't like it. I think it's fine so far, and I'm enjoying some elements of it. But I will say, like a lot of other novels from the 18th century, this book is just so digressive. So I'm 100 pages into the story, and we are only just starting to meet Tom Jones, the hero of this story. So Fielding is definitely like taking his time in introducing us to some of the characters, giving us some more context about their relationships to one another. And I have found that to be a bit slow in the first 100 pages um, because a lot of the characters are kind of like religious hypocrites, which means that they're going off on these long spiels that I haven't loved following. So I will say like the humor hasn't fully caught me yet. I'm hoping that I get more attached into this one when a plot really kicks in uh, because right now it's just kind of been these rambles and digressions. I'm not giving up hope in this one yet but it really has not blown me away yet on the first week. So that's how week one went down. It was a rocky start 
but I've been gaining more confidence each day and I'm just so excited about the books that I've picked. So I'm hoping that week two is going to be more consistent and that I can continue to make some progress. There are a few good things to look forward to this week. The weather is going above zero degrees for like a few days in a row, which is very exciting. Also in Canada this week, the Canada Reads debates are airing. So those are happening from Monday through Thursday. So that will be an hour of each day that I will not be spending reading, but I will be putting on Canada Reads <laughs> during my lunch break to watch Canadians argue about books on TV. It's a fun time. Usually I am angered by something every year, but I'm hoping that's not going to be the case this year. But if you are Canadian and watching this, uh, let me know who you're hoping to win the debates this year. I personally am rooting for Johnny Appleseed, but we'll see how it goes. So that's really it for my update. If you're participating in the readathon, let me know how the first few days have been going so far for you and I will see you again later hopefully next week in another update video. See ya!